I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and we're here to explore the past 25 years of mutants. This is X-Men Then vs. Now. Make sure to subscribe and click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. I, I play the drums, I don't play the guitar, I'm sorry. The X-Men Animated Series Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created the first X-Men comic in 1963, and these mutants have been wildly popular ever since. 29 years after the comics came out, Fox Kids Network released the first X-Men cartoons in 1992 on the Saturday morning cartoon block. I was born in 1992. Off to a good start. The show closely followed the colorful 90s comic book adaptation, X-Men Legacy. Character designs drew a lot of influence from the illustrations of comic book artist Jim Lee. In the show, the X-Men are in their prime as an elite task force of mutant freedom fighters, defending their honor against all those who threaten their kind, while teaching young mutants the true power of being gifted with such abnormalities. The show focuses on Charles Xavier, also known as Professor X, the founder and leader of the X-Men, as well as X-Men favorites Cyclops, Jean Grey, Storm, Rogue, Gambit, Beast, Wolverine, and Jubilee. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait, that's it? What about Kitty Pride? Despite appearing in an earlier TV pilot called Pride of the X-Men, the show surprisingly doesn't feature Kitty Pride. After Fox decided not to pick up Pride of the X-Men, Marvel replaced her with Jubilee in a grittier, modernized take on the supergroup. But the show's trials and tribulations didn't stop there. Its pilot episode was scheduled to air long before it was completed. The pilot itself was so full of errors that the Korean animation studio behind it deemed it impossible to fix in time to make their pilot air date. But after working around the clock to fix the errors, the pilot made it to air on time. However, it still had plenty of problems with the animation. Over time, the showrunners improved the rocky relationship with the animation studio, but not without some concession. In order to make deadlines, the studio refused to animate 360 degree shots of complicated characters and avoided close ups of Wolverine's claws, which were difficult to animate consistently. Despite these challenges, the show blossomed into a classic. -na 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 -na. I, I can't, I can't stop thinking of the show without thinking of that, you know, that theme song. Anyone? Anyone with me? The series focused on many social and emotional aspects of being a mutant and dealt with topics like divorce, religion, prejudice, and other social issues that were relevant then and remain relevant now. The show took notes from comics like Days of Future Past and The Dark Phoenix Saga. Many episodes also paid tribute to specific comic issues. The episode Enter Magneto, for example, relates to the 1963 debut issue X-Men No. 1. X-Men the animated series covers a lot of ground and a lot of plot points that come up in the comics. And as a result, the show is a rogues gallery of canon characters, with Apocalypse and Shadow King, Iceman, Lady Death, Strike and even Spider-Man making an appearance. A common element that runs throughout all X-Men animated series is the ongoing tension between human and mutants. This endless unrest inevitably leads to government involvement, and later the interference of the rebel group of mutants led by Magneto. X-Men the animated series dealt with the human mutant discord in a thoughtful way, perhaps because its creators refused to make creative concessions despite pressure from executives. Eric Lee Wald, a writer on the show, told THR that executives often wanted the show to take a less serious tone and to include ample opportunities for merchandising because it's all about the money. When an Australian fast food chain cut a deal to include X-Men toys in their kids' meals, the show's creators were tasked with incorporating the toys into the show. They refused, despite tremendous pressure, and that set the tone for the team moving forward. They'd stick to their guns and make the show they wanted to make. Which is amazing on their part, because I think that, you know, if you have a vision, you have a vision and you just want to do it. Good on them. X-Men Evolution, which is the one I grew up with. 2003 introduced fans to the third longest running series, as well as the highest rated series in the entire franchise, X-Men Evolution. It ran for a total of four seasons on the Kids WB network. This new series came with an all new look, designed by producer Boyd Kirkland and artist Frank Parr, whose biggest concern was the new anime influenced costume designs. Apparently, it was very important for the new designs to be far more animation friendly than their previous versions. Evolution also took the X-Men back to their roots, showing us a side of them we hadn't seen before. In the series, many of them were still teenagers learning to control their newfound power while attending high school and Xavier's Institute. This was an attempt to reach a younger audience, and it differentiates this series from its predecessor, in which the X-Men team were already fully assembled and battling bigotry. Battling bigotry! In this rendition, the X-Men are led by Professor X, Wolverine, Storm, and Beast as they recruit and coach younger mutants like Cyclops, Jean Grey, Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, Rogue, and Spike, who was an original to this series and not in the comics. I kind of don't remember Spike, but that's probably just me. I gotta rewatch this series. In later seasons, the band of mutants expanded to cover many fan favorites like Gambit, Sabretooth, and many, many more. Since Evolution had teenage characters, it dealt with many coming of age issues, often using the characters' mutant powers as a metaphor for the struggles of teenage adolescents. The first season was centered around Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants, while later seasons featured Apocalypse and the anti mutant weapon known as the Sentinel, which was reintroduced as a common enemy. The episode plots were mostly original, but minor details from the X Men canon were included throughout, like Beast's origin story, despite the change in profession and sex. 
setting. Mesmero is shown as part of a circus troupe as seen in the Phoenix Saga, and many supporting characters from the Marvel Universe, like Nick Fury and Captain America, appear as an homage to the original X-Men comics. And there you go, that's about my favorite series. Let me know what yours is. Wolverine and the X-Men Wolverine and the X-Men debuted in the US in January 2009 on Nickelodeon. The show only lasted for one season, which is why I don't quite remember it. The show was based on the astonishing X-Men comic book series, including the look, the tone, and the overall story arc of the comic series. The story picks up after the X-Men have disbanded and gone their separate ways. Logan Howlett, aka Wolverine, is the main character, setting this series apart from the rest. But like every series before it, there's a focus on the human mutant rivalry and the government sanctioned MRD, or the Mutant Response Division. Due to the increasing number of human protests and attacks on innocent mutants, Wolverine decides to team up with Beast to reunite the X-Men and address the growing resentment towards mutants. In this rendition, Wolverine is less of a lone wolf and more of a team leader, marking a shift in his character from the previous series. A bunch of other characters have changed too, but many haven't grown the way Wolverine did. The series kicks off with a dramatic falling out between Rogue and Wolverine, leading her to fall in with the wrong crowd, the Brotherhood of Mutants, Magneto's rebel group. Cyclops has gone off the deep end following the disappearance of his main squeeze, Jean Grey, which, spoiler alert, is due to amnesia, and Professor X is comatose and the Institute has been demolished. So without me really saying it, I'm pretty sure you already noticed the darker tone here. X-Men 2011 In collaboration with the Japanese studio Madhouse, Marvel Animation created Marvel Anime, which encompassed four different anime series, one of which was the 2011 X-Men series that aired on G4. And I remember this. This was... This was kind of crazy because, like, there were so many Marvel anime and they looked so, like, chiseled in all of them. It was crazy. I don't know. I like anime a lot and this, like blew my mind. The series design and tone was that of a sci-fi anime series, and as any anime fan will tell you, like me, they can get pretty freaking dark and depressing. So the tone is by far the darkest of all the animated X-Men series. Although certain plot points may seem similar to the 2009 animation, they're definitely taken to the extreme in this version. The plot picks up after the Dark Phoenix saga. Jean Grey is dead and the X-Men have separated. They're later reassembled by Professor X and travel to Japan, where this series takes place, in an attempt to rescue their recently kidnapped member, Armor. But come on. It's because it's anime, that's why it's in Japan. There, they discover that certain mutants are suffering from a mysterious affliction called Damon Hull Syndrome, which affects mutants in monstrous ways. It caused mutants to develop secondary mutations that were often extremely dangerous and hard to control. The X-Men begin to investigate and stumble upon a conspiracy involving a lunatic cult called the U-Men and the Inner Circle, an extremist group bent on controlling and manipulating Jean Grey. They're essentially another brotherhood of mutants, only these guys steal mutant organs and implant them in humans in an effort to create a super army. The U-Men first made an appearance in Grant Morrison's popular new X-Men series and represented a new breed of human mutant discrimination. This series explored more of the dramatic side of the X-Men that had been overlooked or barely touched on in previous iterations. The love triangle between Wolverine, Jean Grey, and Cyclops comes to the fore, as does Cyclops' downward spiral after Jean's death. Although this X-Men series pays homage to many original comic book plot points and characters, it's basically its own original storyline. And the animation's great, so if you haven't checked it out already, get to it. Feature Films 20th Century Fox acquired the rights to the X-Men characters in 1994, and since then they've been producing live-action films every few years. One, two, three. Pretty sure there are six films, right? Oh, there are ten! Oh my god! There are currently ten X-Men and X-Men related films, all based on stories from the comic book series. However, the timeline's more confusing than other Marvel films because there's both time travel and an alternate timeline involved. So if any fans want to follow the story in chronological order, it goes something like this. X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, and then the timeline splits into two. Timeline A includes X-Men Origins, Wolverine, X-Men, X2, X-Men The Last Stand, and The Wolverine. While Timeline B includes X-Men Apocalypse, Deadpool, and Logan. Despite there being so many Many films, most of these titles received positive reviews from critics. X-Men The Last Stand and X-Men Apocalypse were met with mixed reviews, while X-Men Origins Wolverine was the only film thus far to receive negative critical reception. And it's the only film that made you want a Deadpool movie more than ever. Because they ruined Deadpool so bad. Still, it didn't slow the franchise down. There's already several more films lined up for release, including The New Mutants, which I'm super excited for, Gambit, which I'm also super excited for, Deadpool 2, and X-Men Dark Phoenix, which I'm also excited for. Just, just, I'm just excited for all of these. I love these. Legion and the Gifted In 2017, two live-action X-Men TV series were released to continue the legacy, and those are Legion and the Gifted. The FX show, Legion, focuses on the Marvel character David Haller, aka Legion, an unsuspecting mutant who was diagnosed with schizophrenia at a young age. David lives most of his life as a patient transferring from hospital to hospital until a sudden encounter opens his eyes to the truth. He's not mentally ill, he's a mutant. 
As for Fox's new show, The Gifted, it's somewhat reminiscent of X-Men Evolution in that it focuses on young mutants discovering new superpowers. However, this is a more generic version of that story. It utilizes unknown characters and explores their situation through the eyes of their parents that have to hide their children as fugitives from the mutant-hungry government, another common theme found in the old animated series. Neither one of these series takes place in any of the timelines covered in the feature films, mostly because they're already so convoluted and confusing. So these series actually take place in their own timelines set in motion by the events of X-Men Days of Future Past. Well, at least we know that's the case for The Gifted, according to series executive producer Matt Nix. As for Legion, the chronology is less clear, but that's intentional. Supposedly, Holler is the son of Charles Xavier. However, there are many questionable elements planted within the show, like vintage designs combined with modern day elements. If that wasn't enough to boggle the brain, there's no official statement to clear up the confusion either. So for now, you'll just have to keep watching. Only time will tell. I'm Adrian, and thanks for watching The X-Men Then vs. Now. Which X-Men series is your favorite? Did we miss anything? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. We have videos dropping every week, so make sure to subscribe. And remember, Frederator loves you.